It's good to see so many of you here. <clears throat> uh, probably the first time that some of you are coming here. Welcome. Our theme for this weekend is the higher Christian life. I want to say a word about, thank you, about the hymns that we sing. <clears throat> From my own experience, uh, <clears throat> when I was converted 63 years ago, <clears throat> I used to go to church and I really enjoyed singing the songs. And after a little while, I would know these memorize these songs and know them by heart. And what happened then was gradually I began to sing them without meaning the words that I was singing. And I had some experiences like that. We used to use a songbook in those days. I'm talking about more than 50, 60 years ago. And <clears throat> the song leader would say, let's sing another song. and. Everybody turns to the other song in the songbook. And I suddenly realize, I don't even remember what, was, what I told the Lord in the last song. So what I would do is, while the others were singing that song, I turn back to the song we just finished singing, and I go through it slowly and I say, Lord, I'm sorry. I just sang this without thinking that you're here and I'm talking to you. And I go through that line by line and it took me a while <clears throat> to gradually come to the place where when I sing, I'm aware that Jesus is right here. Where two or three are gathered in my name, I am in the midst, and that I'm singing to him. And that made such a difference in my life that singing was not just a time of entertainment or having uh, good sing-song time, as they say. It was a meaningful communication to the Lord. And when we sang about the cross or time, even years later, 50, 60 years later, there'd be tears in my eyes as I sing about, think about Jesus dying for me. And the Lord showed me in Revelation chapter 5, I want to show you this. You know, there's going to be a lot of singing in heaven. And uh, if you can't keep a tune on earth, don't worry. When you get there, God will make you so perfect, you'll be singing along with everybody else perfectly. But more important than singing in tune, we'll be meaning. So this is the word that the Lord spoke to me from Revelation chapter 5. It's, Revelation gives us a few glimpses of heaven. And one of the glimpses of heaven is this. In Revelation chapter 5, we read about some elders in verse 6. There was the elders, a lamb was standing in the midst of the elders. And he came and took the book and the elders and the others sang a new song. It says in verse 9, Worthy art thou, the word new, when it says a new song, the meaning is something ever fresh. So that's how it came to me. When they sing in heaven, they may be singing it for the thousandth time, but it's fresh. And we believe that the Holy Spirit has come to bring heaven into our hearts, a foretaste of it, even before we get there. And so, Lord, I, want, I said, Lord, I want to have a foretaste of this, where when I'm singing a song for the hundredth time, it's going to be fresh as if I've never sung it before. And particularly something like this, <clears throat> verse 9, they sang this ever fresh song saying, in the middle of that verse, you were slain. You died on the cross. Hey, we say that's an old story. That's been, we've known that for 2,000 years. But they're singing it as if they're hearing for the first time that Jesus died for me on the cross and that was one of my prayers and it still is 
Lord, when I sing about the cross, about what you suffered, when you suffered hell for me on those three hours when you were forsaken on the cross, for my sin, to save me from the wretched person I was, and to take me into your eternal kingdom. When I sing about it, let it not be something like some reading the newspaper or some old story. Let me realize the seriousness of it. And I'll tell you many, many times when you sing about the cross, even today, there are tears in my eyes that my Savior died for me. I want to encourage you. It won't happen overnight. But if you make a decision today that when you sing, you're going to try and mean the words that you sing, especially about the cross of Calvary. I'll tell you, maybe in a year or two, it will become real in your life, where every time you sing, you'll be singing directly to Jesus. It will no longer be a routine sing-song session anymore. And that will make a world of difference. Is the best way to prepare your heart to listen to the message. It's made a great difference in my life. <clears throat> and the Holy Spirit has come here to help us. So the higher Christian life, let me turn to 1 John chapter 2, verse 6. If there is one verse, perhaps more than any other verse, there are other verses too that explains what the higher Christian life is. It's this. 1 John chapter 2, first epistle of John chapter 2 and verse 6. The one who says he abides in Christ, and most of us, if not all, we say we are in Christ. We received Christ as our Savior and Lord and Christ came into us and we are in Christ as members of his body. Well, if we say that or we sing that, then we have a responsibility. It's an amazing verse. To walk in the same manner <clears throat> as he walked. That is the higher Christian life. <clears throat> the way Jesus walked on earth that was the most blessed the happiest most victorious every adjective you can use <clears throat> a wonderful life that anybody can ever live he wasn't the richest man on earth he didn't live to the age of 60 or 70 he lived only up to 33 and he started his ministry only when he was 30, <clears throat> for three and a half years. And yet at the end of his life, <clears throat> he looked up to the Father in John chapter 17. <clears throat> he was praying to the Father. <clears throat> this is the longest prayer of Jesus recorded in scripture, John 17, it's a prayer. And Jesus lifted up his eyes to heaven and he said, verse 4, one of the things he said was, I have glorified you on earth. How did Jesus glorify the Father on earth? By finishing the work which you gave me to do. All through his life, he was conscious that the Father had sent him to earth with a particular task to be accomplished. It wasn't just dying on the cross. It was ministering to so many people, preaching God's word, preaching the Sermon on the Mount, healing blind people, and so many things. <clears throat> and of course, working up to the age of 30 as a carpenter, that was also part of God's will for him to show that Christianity is not just preaching and singing, it is practical work. And... Uh, earning one's living and he grew up in a poor home <clears throat> with his Joseph had died and it was his responsibility to take care of his mother widowed mother and 
He had four younger brothers and two younger sisters, Mary's children, and he was the eldest. And it was his responsibility to earn. He finished the work God gave him to do, and preaching was only 10% of that. Three and a half years out of 33 and a half. So that secular job that he did for maybe from the age of 18 to 30 was part of the work the father gave him to do. You say, why in the world does Jesus have to come here and work as a carpenter? Because 99.99% of Christians are not preachers or full-time workers. Almost all of you sitting here, you're not preachers or full-time workers. You're in a secular job. So if Jesus could only be an example to preachers, how, how would he be an example to you? In a secular job to be faithful, not to love money, and uh, meditate on how Jesus was in the carpenter shop. That is the higher Christian life. Walking as Jesus walked in our secular job. And I've meditated on that. You know, in a world where there's so much of stealing and telling lies and cheating people in jobs. I mean, I've <clears throat> seen a lot of carpenters and their work in Bangalore, India, where I live, and most of them would cheat. They will not use the wood that they say they are using. And when cracks come up, they'll patch it up so that it, the buyer doesn't see it. I'm sure Jesus was tempted like that too. When he bought a piece of wood to make a table for someone and a crack came in, the temptation to cover it up and no, oh, he says, I would, well, if he saw, if it did crack and he covered it up, he'd tell the buyer, this is cracked and I've covered it up. Would you like to buy it like this? Otherwise I'll make another one for you. You can't make money when you're going to be upright like that and honest. But you'll be able to say at the end of your life, Father, I finished the work you gave me to do. It's all a question of what your goal in life is. If Jesus' goal in life was to make money, then he'd be like everybody else, cover up all these things and pretend that everything he sold was perfect when it was not. Remember, he was tempted just like us. The Bible says Jesus was tempted just like us. And the higher Christian life is to manifest on this sin-cursed earth where people cheat and tell lies and only th in think in terms of profit and money making and how to take advantage of others to live in such a way that I would take advantage of no one. And if, I, if there is a loss, I will bear that loss. That's how Jesus lived. And I can imagine how if a little child came into his carpentry shop and broke something, he wouldn't get upset with that child. He'd pick up the child and kiss it and say, it's all right, don't worry, I can make another one. Imagine living like that. You're not going to be the richest carpenter in Nazareth that way. But you'll finish the work God gave you to do. And you may not be a carpenter, but whatever work you do, there are many temptations. I found when I was working in the Navy, any place, Temptations are the same, to tell lies, to get some advantage for ourselves. I remember one of the situations I was in where I was in charge of all the boats in the naval base in India. They appoint different officers to be in charge of that. And we have a commander and a commanding officer, a captain on top of that. And the boats, the officers were permitted to use the boats, but they had to pay for the diesel. So if an officer used a boat, he got a bill for the diesel and he could use it. But when the captain used the boat, you know, the previous boat officers would not send him a bill. When he went for a picnic with his family, he was permitted to do it, provided he paid for the diesel. Uh, they would show it as, captain has gone for harbor inspection official duty no charge so when I became board officer for the first time the captain got a bill I sent him a bill and the second in command the commander came to me and said Lieutenant Poonin hasn't the previous board officer told you what to do when the captain takes the boat 
I said, yes, sir, but my conscience doesn't permit me to tell a lie. In half an hour, they transferred me from that job. I praise the Lord. I'm thankful for such situations where I said, Lord, I'm not interested in his writing a good report at me about me at the end of the year. I knew I wouldn't get the promotions that I would, that I wanted if I was going to walk as Jesus walked. But I said, Lord, I want to please you. I want to say at the end of my life that I finished the work the Father gave me to do, that I was a witness. And I'll tell you something, they may not, uh, they may disagree with you and all, but they'll never forget you. And I remember from that naval base, I, I resigned when I was 26 and I came out to serve the Lord. But 40 years later, a colleague of mine who was in that naval base and who met me in Bangalore in a retired naval officers meeting, he was an admiral. And he said to me, Zach, I can never forget you, what you were. They remembered years later that once in their life they met a true Christian who was different. And I believe that is your calling in mind, brothers and sisters, wherever you work, people you deal with, shopkeepers, family members, neighbors, they may be upset with you for being so upright and all that, but they will never forget you. Remember this, may people who come across your path and know you well, all their life remember that at least once in their life they met a true Christian, a disciple of Jesus, who would never cheat them, who would never get upset with them, who wouldn't get angry or upset even if they were supposed to do something for you and they didn't. You know, we live in a fallen world and we all make mistakes right from childhood. I'm 83 years old, but I make mistakes now. We'll never do anything perfect till Jesus comes again. And therefore, we have to be merciful to others. It's beginning with our own home. We must be merciful to the members in our own home. When they make a mistake, say, it's okay. Did something get broken? It's fine. We can always buy another one. Or we can do without it if we can't afford to buy another one. Nothing is so important that we have to lose our temper and get upset and be bothered by it for the whole day. No, there isn't. Think of it like this. 2,000 years from now, when you look back over your life and you look at that incident that happened in your home or in your place of work that you got so upset about, what are you going to think about it 2,000 years from now? Is it going to be so important, so valuable? Not at all. That is the higher Christian life. And I'll tell you this, you will not become bankrupt by going this way. No. God is a loving Father. And if you are upright, you may not make as much money as other people. Good. But He'll provide for every need of yours. That's absolutely certain. I've experienced that ever since I left the Navy 56 years ago. All these years, God's taken care of me and my family without my sending prayer letters or ever asking anyone for money. God's taken care of us. He'll take care of you. I'll tell you He'll take care of you. You don't have to be afraid of whatever. There may be famine in the land, but God will take care of you. I'll tell you why. Because of one promise of Scripture, Matthew 6.33, Seek first, it's a well-known verse, Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these earthly things, food, clothing, shelter, the necessities of life, will be added to you. That's how Jesus lived. Jesus did not live in tension at any time. For three and a half years, he was a full-time worker of the, for the Father. He would never, he never sent prayer letters asking for money like a lot of missionaries do today. He never did that. He never advertised his work. He never asked for money, but he knew the Father would provide for him. Somebody would give him a gift and he would take care of that and he learned to live simply. He did not go and live in the most expensive restaurants 
uh, very expensive hotels when he traveled from uh, Galilee to Jerusalem. You know, Jerusalem was probably 100 miles away from Galilee and it would take him three days to walk up there and walk back uh, whenever he went there. You read in the Bible that he went from Galilee to Jerusalem, but you forget that it took him three days to go there. He's walking with his disciples and having fellowship along the way. And when he went to Jerusalem, sometimes he, people would invite him to a home to live in. Sometimes he slept under the trees in the Mount of Olives without a complaint. It's wonderful to see how Jesus lived on this earth and say, Lord, this is the higher life. This is the way I want to live on this earth. And I believe that the Lord sent the Holy Spirit to enable every one of us to live this higher life. So it says in John chapter 16, I want to show you this verse. When the Holy Spirit has come, verse 13, you know, there's a lot of confusion concerning the ministry of the Holy Spirit. I love my brothers and sisters in the Pentecostal and charismatic churches, but I have to honestly say I don't agree with their emphasis on what they call supernatural things, uh, their public manifestation of speaking in tongues. Now, the speaking in tongues, let me tell you, is a gift of the Holy Spirit. But it's a gift, the Bible says, which God gives us, let me explain to you briefly. It's a gift God gives to some people, not to everyone, to when they have to express what is in their heart to God. It's a gift not for public prayer, never. It's for private prayer when one cannot express to God what's sufficiently in one's own language that God gives him another language. God's given me that gift 47 years ago and I've used it never in public, only in private, my communication with my heavenly bridegroom. You know how husbands and wives speak things to each other that they never want anybody else to listen to. That's how we are supposed to speak to our heavenly bridegroom. And for that he gives us the gift if we want it, if we need it. And it's a useful gift, but when it, the way it is used so often in other places I don't agree with. That's not the primary purpose of the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has come. Let me show you John 16, 13. The Holy Spirit, when he has come, the Spirit of truth, he will guide you into all the truth. And the word truth, by the way, is reality. That's the meaning of truth in the New Testament. The opposite of Truth is falsehood. The opposite of reality is hypocrisy, pretending what is not true. So the Holy Spirit will lead me and you to live a true life. That means what you see me is what I am. I don't have another life behind the scenes. I'm not another person inside. Then I am visible on the outside. Now I'll tell you that was not true of my life in the early days of my Christian life. I never knew what it was to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I was born again and I lived the way most Christians live. I was really born again. I knew if I died I'd go to heaven. But I did not live on earth the way God wanted me to live. It says here everyone who says he abides in Christ must walk as he walked. Well I wasn't living like that. I would get angry upset. My thoughts were not always pure. And I'd fall and get up. And of course, I would always confess my sin to the Lord. Say, Lord, forgive me, and I'd be cleansed. But I was absolutely certain that I'd fall again and fall again. But I always the blood of Christ was there to cleanse me. I treated the blood of Christ like tap water. We're never afraid of getting our hands dirty because tap water is cheap. You can always go and wash your hands. That's why a lot of people are casual about their sin. Because they say, the blood of Christ is there to cleanse me. It's treating the blood of Christ like tap water. It's an insult. Peter says, the blood of Christ is more precious than all the gold and silver in the world. And in Hebrews 10, in verse 29, it says, warns us, don't treat the blood of Christ like a common thing, like tap water. Take it seriously. So I asked myself this question. I said, if, if tap water cost $1,000 a 
for a cup, boy, I'd be very careful not to dirty my hands. It's going to be pretty expensive to wash my hands every time. And if I recognize the blood of Christ is so precious, I'll be very careful not to sin. I won't say, well, I can always go to Christ and get it be cleansed. So as I said, I never, I, unfortunately, I was not taught these truths in the church I went to when I was converted. And most churches, they don't teach you to value the blood of Christ and to stay away from sin or that the Holy Spirit can help you. But it, all this made me very desperate and I began to seek God and said, Lord, I want a better life than this. I want a higher life. I'm living at a very low level. And that's the level most of the others were living at. I once asked a missionary who was 15 years older than me. I thought he would know the answer. And I asked him, I said, brother, how do we get victory over dirty thoughts? He changed the subject and talked about something else. I got the answer. He hadn't got victory himself. And that's the truth with many, many men, particularly born again men. They've never taken seriously the matter of having a pure thought life. Was Jesus tempted like us? Yes. Did he have dirty thoughts? No. Is it possible for us to come to that life, not overnight, but get there? Yes. The Holy Spirit, when he's come, he'll guide you into reality into a life of truthfulness, reality. That means what you see is what I am. What you see is what I am in my home life, in my office, in my thoughts, inwardly. That is the life the Holy Spirit wants to come to. That's the meaning of truth. That's why he's called the spirit of truth, the spirit of reality. And it says here further, verse 14 in the middle, he will take of the things of Christ and reveal it to me. So one of the functions of the Holy Spirit is to show me how Jesus lived on this earth. That's the meaning of that verse. He will disclose. Disclose is a, it's like reveal. Disclose is a word which means uh, telling us something which is a secret. You know, we people, people, he disclosed that secret. It's not something openly known. It's something which is hidden, which he discloses. So, there are things about Jesus' life that the Holy Spirit can show us from the scriptures. What you read in this, otherwise in the scriptures is that Jesus healed the sick, raised the dead, the sermons he preached. But about Jesus, the inner principles by which Jesus lived, that's what the Holy Spirit will show us as we read the scriptures. I can give you one or two examples. The higher Christian life. Turn to Matthew chapter 12. In Matthew chapter 12, we read of a time when there was a demon-possessed person, verse 22, was brought to Christ. He was blind and dumb. And Jesus healed him. He immediately began to speak and he could see. And all the crowds, Matthew 12, 23, were amazed. They said, this must be the Messiah that we've been waiting for all these years, the son of David. But the Pharisees, who were jealous of this, who could never do a miracle themselves, who would just keep preaching the Bible. They were jealous and said, no, this is the work of demons. This man is doing it by the power of Beelzebul, which is another name for Satan, the ruler of demons. This man's possessed and ruled by Satan. You know, it's a terrible thing to call any human being Satan or ruled by Satan. Imagine how much worse to call the son of God as one being ruled by Satan. Can that sin be forgiven? We read of a time when Miriam, Moses' sister, 
criticized Moses for marrying a non-Israeli woman. And you know God struck her with leprosy? Yeah, you read that in the book of Numbers. Just because she criticized God's servant. Saying, Miriam, that's none of your business. Then Moses had to pray for her to be healed. There was another time when the Elisha, the prophet, had just taken over the ministry from Elijah and he was coming back. 42 young men, you read that in 2 Kings, made fun of him. You know, Elijah had gone up in a chariot of fire and they made fun of Elisha saying, you bald, Elisha was bald. You bald man, you also go up, go up. Made fun of him. And bears came out of the forest and killed all those 42 young men. It's a serious thing to speak against a servant of God. So what is the punishment for someone who calls Jesus the devil? Miriam got healing. No, Miriam got leprosy. These 42 young men were killed. They got death. You know what the Pharisees got from Jesus? Forgiveness. Jesus looked at them and said in verse 32, If you have spoken a word against the Son of Man, it's forgiven. That is the higher Christian life. We don't expect judgment to come on a person who harms us. That's the low level. The higher Christian life is, it's all right, you're forgiven. Even if you hurt me, even if you harmed me or my family. This is what Jesus has taught us and the Holy Spirit helps us. I've heard people tell me this. Oh, Brother Zach, the way that fellow treated me, I can never forgive him. I say, well, brother, then you'll never get to heaven. I'll tell you that right now. If you don't forgive him, you're not going to go to heaven. Now, I'm not saying you should forgive him because you want to go to heaven. You must forgive him because Jesus forgave you. What has he done compared to what you have done against Christ? The well-known Lord's Prayer is actually a prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. You know what it is in Matthew 6 and verse 9. Our Father who art in heaven. And one line of it says, Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us, verse 12, our sins, our debts. Exactly like we have forgiven others. Do you know that when you ask the Lord, ask God your Father to forgive you, this is the way we have to pray for forgiveness. Not just, oh God, forgive me. Jesus said, pray like this. Forgive me my sins exactly like I have forgiven other people who have hurt me, who have sinned against me. It's connected. There were a number of requests that Jesus made in this prayer, about six of them. But out of all those six requests he mentioned in this prayer, he picks out one. He taught us to pray. God's name should be hallowed. His kingdom must come. His will must be done. We must pray for our daily food. We must pray for forgiveness. And we must pray for victory over sin and Satan. Then out of all these six requests, he picks out one and emphasizes it. You know which one it is? Forgiveness. You see that in verse 14. He doesn't emphasize the other five. But out of the six, he emphasizes this particular one. And he emphasizes if, oh that IF must be in capital letters. If you forgive others their sins, only then, only then, your heavenly Father will forgive you. Okay, Lord, understood. No, I must repeat it. Verse 15. If you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive you your sins. A double emphasis on that one out of those six requests in the prayer. 
When you read the Bible carefully, you see certain things Jesus emphasizes. Like, you know, if your dad writes a letter to you and he underlines something. All of it is important, but the underlined part is very important. He's underlining this. Remember out of these six requests, remember this one thing. You ask for forgiveness in exactly the same way as you have forgiven others. Forgive me, Father, as I have forgiven others. Now, if I have forgiven somebody with saying, well, I'll never... I'll always remember, I'll keep a grudge against you. You're asking God to always keep a grudge against you. Because you're saying, forgive me exactly like I've forgiven that guy. No, I don't want God to keep a grudge against me. It's very, very important. If you do not forgive others, your father will not forgive you. Now, if God doesn't forgive a man, and he dies in that condition, where is he going to go? His sin is not forgiven and he dies. Is there some place after death, some sort of purgatory where he can get cleansed and have his sin forgiven? No. Hebrews 9.27, it is appointed unto men once to die, after that the judgment. So, if you missed doing something that you should have done on earth, there's no chance for it in eternity. You're gone, it's over. And it's very clear, if you don't forgive others, your father will not forgive you. I don't wish that any of you would die like that. Life is very uncertain. Who can say how long he'll live? How can we say the Bible says don't even boast about tomorrow? James chapter 4 says your life is like a vapor. You know it's like a little smoke. It's there next moment it's gone. It says your life is like that. And so don't boast even about tomorrow he says in James 4. Just say if the Lord wills we will live tomorrow. And we'll come for the morning meeting here. If the Lord wills. That's exactly what it says in James chapter 4. And so it's very important therefore to have short accounts with God. Don't take anything on credit. Say I'll pay later. No. Pay immediately. Pay means ask for forgiveness immediately. It's already been paid on the cross. But avail of it now. And in order to avail of forgiveness you must forgive others. So I want to pause a little here. This is the higher Christian life. I'll tell you why it's higher. Because most Christians that I have met, I'm not talking about non-Christians. Most Christians that I've met, and I've been in the ministry, as I said, 56 years, I've had the opportunity to counsel with hundreds and hundreds of people in many, many countries. And I'll tell you that most Christians that I've met have a grudge against someone. Somebody did something to them years ago when they were young or did something to their family, to their son or daughter or something and, and they just haven't forgiven that person. They don't take him to court or anything but they got this little grudge against that person. If not forgiven. And they're all the time asking God to forgive him. Now I don't know how many preachers have told you this very in plain words as I'm saying right now and emphasizing it like I am emphasizing it now. There are many things in scripture, but some things that need to be emphasized. You know, Jesus sometimes used to say, Verily, verily, I say unto you. Truly, truly, I say unto you. That's the meaning of that. Verily means truly. Why does he have to emphasize that? Isn't everything Jesus says the truth? Would he ever tell a lie? Every word was true. Then why did he have to say, Truly, truly, he was underlining certain things. Why did he have to repeat after saying that we must pray for forgiveness like we forgive others? Why did we have to why did he have to repeat it in two further sentences saying, if you don't forgive, you won't be forgiven? If you want forgiveness, forgive others. Why? Because Jesus knew human weakness. We take some of these things lightly. 
I'm sure all of you, and if you're born in a Christian family, you probably heard this prayer from childhood. My father was a born again Christian. And from the earliest childhood, he taught me to memorize this prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And even before I was born again, he taught us to kneel down on our bed as soon as he woke up. And I would kneel down on my bed and pray that prayer before I got out of bed every day. I mean, it was a, I was repeating it like a parrot. I didn't mean it. But anyway, you've all heard that prayer. I'm sure you've all repeated it. I want to ask you, how seriously have you taken this one part of that prayer, which you probably prayed for years? Forgive me exactly like I have forgiven everybody else. The lower Christian life is the type of life most Christians are living. Keeping grudges, unforgiveness. I'm not the judge of humanity. God is the judge. But I'm a servant of God who has to proclaim the truth. And the truth is this, according to Jesus' own words, that if people who die without forgiving others, they will not be forgiven for all eternity. And where do they go? Well, you know. Now again, let me repeat. It's not because I want to go to heaven that I want to forgive people. Let me read a verse in Ephesians. And chapter. Ephesians. Chapter 4. In the last verse, Ephesians 4, verse 32. Be kind to one another, tender hearted, and listen to this forgiving each other exactly like God in Christ has forgiven you. It's the same thing. Because God has forgiven us so much a million times more than the few things a few human beings have done against us. We should forgive them. You know, I don't believe that any of us, me included, realize how many sins we have committed in our life. We think of a few things. Our understanding of sin is so limited that we are aware of a few things which are serious, which say, oh, we've done this, we've done this, we've done this. But when we get into the, I'll tell you from my own experience, as I've come closer and closer to the Lord in these 60 years, I've discovered more and more some things which I never thought were sin. Wrong attitudes towards people, which I never thought was sin. But I get light on, you know, it's like you go from the kindergarten to grade one, and then you learn something more, and you go to grade two, you learn something more. And you, if you, you're faithful in your education, you go up to grade 7, 8, 9, 10, you learn a lot of things you never learned in kindergarten. Christian life is really like that. Unfortunately, a lot of Christians sit in the kindergarten all their lives. They never learn anything new. I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm wanting to learn something new next year and this year, which I never know before, of Christ-likeness. What is unlike Christ in me, Lord? Show me. I want to get rid of everything that's unlike the external things I've got rid of. I'm not cheating anybody. I'm paying all my taxes uprightly. I'm asking forgiveness from anybody I accidentally hurt. And I'm not expecting uh, anything from people. But there are still inner attitudes and different things in me that are unchrist like that God begins to show me. I'll give you one example of how uh, something God showed me some years ago. Is it right to expect people to come and say thank you? Now we teach our children. Whenever someone gives you something, say, that's very good manners. And I believe we should teach our children to say thank you. And we must also learn to be grateful to people who do anything for us. Jesus said that if a person gave a person a cup of cold water, he will not lose his reward. Do you remember that verse? That if someone gives you, a, he told his apostles, if someone gives you a cup of cold water, which doesn't cost anything, he will not lose his reward. I've thought of that verse, you know, I use my imagination when I read these verses. 
And I can imagine Jesus has come to set up his throne and he calls up some some little boy or some old sister who lived 2,000 years ago. At the judgment seat, he calls this person up and says, you gave my apostle Peter a cup of cold water. Here is your reward. You believe that? I believe it. He does not forget a cup of cold water that somebody gave to one of his children. That's amazing. And uh, when I thought of that, I said, Lord, I want to be like that too. I want to never forget the little, little things that other people have done for me. And I want to remember that 20 years later, 25 years later, when I meet them, I say, yeah, I remember. You gave me a lift in your car when I was there and I was stuck somewhere. Thank you very much. That was 25 years ago cup of cold water and so when the Lord forgives us so much we mustn't forget it that's more than a cup of water he's forgiven us so much so my what I was going to say is something unchrist like I remember in, there was a young man in our church many years ago who was the only Christian in his family so he used to come in to the meeting and and uh, meetings were late and he would sleep in our house and he felt so free in our home, he'd get up in the morning and make coffee himself and go to college from there. And we helped him a lot. We were very happy and grew up well and spiritually in our home. The church was meeting in our home. But then he did well in his profession and got a big job and went off somewhere else. <laughs> he never wrote any letter to us. We were wondering where he was. And and I was wondering what an ungrateful person he is. After all that we did to him, he doesn't even express his gratitude to us. That's the time the Lord spoke to me. He said, do you remember that passage where the Lord said to people, I was sick and you visited me. I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. And they say, Lord, this is in the day of judgment. Lord, when did we see you like that? And he, the Lord will say to them, Inasmuch as you did it to the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. So here is your reward. So what I learned from that was that when I do something for a brother, I must not expect a thank you or a reward from him. The Lord says, you've done it unto me. Inasmuch as you did it to the least of these my brothers, you've done it unto me. I got light on that verse. Matthew 25. That when I do something for any believer, I'm doing it unto the Lord. And if I'm doing it unto the Lord, from whom should I expect thank you? Not from that person. Not from that brother. But from the Lord. There I got light on something unchristlike in me. What was the unchristlike thing in me? I was expecting gratitude from a human being for what I did for him. Now most people wouldn't even think of that as something un it's not a sin. It's not a sin to expect gratitude, but I saw it as something unchristlike. Because I must do it as unto the Lord. He's a younger brother of Christ. So I've done it unto him. The Lord says, I'll thank you for it. If you expect gratitude, expect it from me, not from him. Boy, I was thankful for that. Because from that day onwards, <laughs> I stopped expecting gratitude from anybody. It was a joy for me to help people, serve people, and it didn't matter one bit if they didn't thank me for it, because I did it as unto a younger brother of Christ, a younger sister of Christ. The Holy Spirit showed me what Jesus was like. It's a wonderful, it's an exciting journey, this Christian life. Day by day as you read the Bible, the Holy Spirit shows you more and more of Christ. Let me show you another example of what this higher Christian life is. Where you don't expect gratitude from people, you expect it from the Lord. 
And I'll tell you, you'll be a very happy person. The people are always expecting people to thank them. They're pretty grumpy inside, even if they smile on the outside. <laughs> They're not very happy inside. You'll be a very happy person if you expect your gratitude only from the Lord in the final day. So let me give you another example. I told you that Jesus had to walk these hundred miles from Galilee to Jerusalem whenever he came there. And that Jerusalem is not his home. It's like you're traveling from, from your hometown to somewhere else. And you're going there for ministry. And Jesus went to Jerusalem and he was preaching. You read in John chapter 7 that he was in Jerusalem preaching. John 7, 37, on the last day of the feast, he got up and he prayed and he cried out saying, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. John 7 and 37. It was the feast day in the temple and Jesus had finished preaching the whole day. And at the end of the day, it says in verse 53, everybody went to his own home. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. It's the same sentence. Unfortunately, the chapter division has broken up that sentence. John 7, 53. Everyone went to his own home, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. John 8, 1. So, I thought about that. By the way, whenever you read these chapter divisions in the Bible, ignore them. Because that's made by men uh, three, four hundred years ago to help us to refer to verses. The original, when John wrote it, there was no break there. So what I saw there was, why in the world did Jesus go to the Mount of Olives? He would have been delighted if some disciple had said, hey, Lord, please come and stay in our home. He would never have said no. Mary and Martha would always invite him, but they were in another town, Bethany. In Jerusalem, they, what, I, what it came to me was nobody invited Jesus home. Imagine a preacher coming to a new place to preach. <laughs> nobody invites him home. It's never happened to me. I've traveled to many countries, but no one's ever left me in the lurch like that. And what did Jesus do? He had no complaints. He said, well, it's not raining. I can go and sleep under the trees on the Mount of Olives. No complaints. I said, Lord, make me like that. No expectations that I have come to serve them and they don't care for me. No. Let me learn to take care of myself without a complaint. The next morning, chapter 8, verse 2, Jesus came in the morning and again sat down in the temple and he began to teach them. Now I'll tell you how the average preacher would begin his sermon if nobody invited him the previous night. Well, last night when I was sleeping under the trees in the Mount of Olives, that would be the first sentence. Then everybody would be alert. Oh, we didn't invite him home. Jesus never said that. He never gave a hint to anybody. Any inconvenience that he suffered because of their lack of concern. I tell you, as a preacher myself, I learned some wonderful things as the Holy Spirit has shown me this higher Christian life, which makes you live without a complaint against a single human being. Your life is one of perpetual joy. It is only then that you can obey the command which says rejoice always, 24-7. You sleep peacefully at night. I'm giving you my testimony. Have you ever slept, have you, have you ever gone to bed and found it difficult to sleep because you're tossing around thinking of somebody who did something against you or said something against you and you toss around and toss around and toss around you lose your sleep Jesus slept peacefully and we can sleep peacefully that is the higher Christian life it's good for our health as well this higher Christian life it's a wonderful life it's a wonderful life many people die early because they keep bitternesses they develop sicknesses. See, God has made us in such a way that the laws of the spirit affect the body as well. 
Dear brothers and sisters, ask the Holy Spirit to lead you higher. I think of a verse and I'll close with this. In the book of Revelation chapter 4, John was looking at all the things on earth, the sad condition of all the churches in chapter 2 and 3. If you read Revelation chapter 2 and 3, it's a pretty pathetic picture of the condition of five of those seven churches. Very bad state of affairs. And John the Apostle, looking at this, is, Lord, what a condition these churches are in. It must have grieved him. So the Lord says to him in verse 4, chapter 4, sorry, verse 1, Come up higher. Come up here. And I'll show you things from here. I believe that's what the Lord is saying to you and me. Come up higher. View things from heaven's standpoint. And that's what God wants to do for all of us. Because it says in Ephesians chapter, uh, sorry, Colossians chapter 3. Colossians 3, verse 1. If you have really been raised up with Christ, then seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above and not on the things that are on earth, for you have died to this earthly life, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Ephesians 2 says we've been raised up with Christ in spirit, we are to live our earthly life with our spirit in heaven while our body is on the earth. It's unbelievable, but it is true. This is the life the Holy Spirit wants to give us. And I pray that we will all make it our earnest prayer. As a result of this weekend's meetings, that we will not only hear and get some information but actually get a hunger for a higher life than we have experienced so far. Hunger and thirst is the first step always. Let's pray. Let's bow our heads in prayer. There are many things we heard today. Don't worry if you don't remember all of them. The Holy Spirit will bring it to your remembrance at the right time. But remember just the first verse that we read in 1 John 2.6. If you say that you are in Christ, you are called to walk as Jesus walked. And the Holy Spirit has come to help you and me. Let there be a cry in your heart saying, Lord, this is the life I want to live. Please help me this weekend to understand how I can live this life. Thank you, Heavenly Father for your word that always seeks to lead us higher, higher, higher. I thank you with all my heart. I pray that everyone here who've taken all this trouble to come here will go away immensely blessed beyond what they expected because of your Holy Spirit moving in our midst. Thank you, Father. It will be so. In Jesus' name. Amen.